the way Martin would do. They have to start crying just because why would you as you go down? It's like, no, I can't even go to the people in this now, they're crying down. I'd like to welcome you all here today on behalf of the Tribal Council. I'm very honored and proud to be a member of our tribe today, thinking of all the things that we, we do for healing. We're trying to bring our community together. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce at this time, at this time, Mr. Uh, Dennis Banks. He's the co-founder of the American Indian Movement. He has spent much of his time protecting the traditional ways of the Indian people and engaging in legal cases protecting the treaty rights of Native Americans. He's traveled the globe lecturing, instilling Native American customs, and sharing his experiences. He is the co-author of a book entitled Ojibwe Warrior, Dennis Banks, and the Rise of the American Indian Movement. Currently, Dennis is leading the longest walk across the nation to raise awareness and preserve diabetes, prevent diabetes. The walk culminates in Washington, D.C. on July 8, 2011. And uh, the, Dennis is a person who, um, as, a young, as, a, as a young woman, I was young once, <laughs> like, you, like you young people here, um, I remember watching the thing about Wounded Knee on TV. And there was this guy with a red bandana. He was very well spoken. And he was always my hero. And I could never believe one day I actually got to meet him. And it was just a couple, maybe four or five years ago. But I'm very honored and proud to introduce Mr. Dennis Banks. I'd like to uh, thank uh some individuals out there, uh, first of all, uh, Shannon and Charmaine for uh, a lot of work that uh, I've seen them doing, participating, organizing, always, always organizing. I'd like to thank Dee out there for doing research on this most important project. For all of those who did research on honoring or doing the pamphlet about uh, what this school was all about. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ross uh, for uh, a couple of years ago we met, uh, we participated in the, the reburial uh, and, and um, walked to the, to the burial spot. I thank Mike for uh, the foundation and the Aboriginal Healing uh, Center that, that you're taking care of. It's sometimes it's a, it's a, you just, you never get, you never get through the day. You always take your work at home and with you. Those kind of people, I'll thank you very much. Good. I'll thank my driver um, for bringing me up here. Uh, his beautiful wife is out there, Carol Collins. Uh, and my, my driver is Paul Collins. Um, he's an artist of sorts, standing right over here. Thank you very much, Paul, for such a wonderful drive up here. So, thank you. Actually, Paul is a well-known artist. He's uh, very well-known, and he came to Wounded Knee. That's where I first met him in 1973 during a conflict out there. Um, so, thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, Ben Hinman's around. Uh, is he around? Nope. Yes. But anyway, thank you, Ben, for the wonderful necklace that I have. I wear it every day, like you said. It's in Florida right now. I'm, uh, I'm doing a walk across America right now. I started on February 14th with my granddaughter out there. She's nine years old. Um, and right now we're in, we're in Florida. We came up here for this uh, because I felt it was it was critical that I come here because I wanted to talk about it. I want to introduce, uh, first of all, my daughter, Darla. Uh, could you stand up, Dar? And, and also, uh, Jessica, my granddaughter. 
I introduced them. Darla's my friend. She's my daughter. She's my friend. But I want but the interesting thing about Darla, she is Anishinaabe. She does not speak Anishinaabe. And neither does Jessica. Jessica is learning it in school. And the reason why they don't speak the Ojibwe language because I don't speak it. And that is why I'm on this stage. It is because of, quote and unquote, a social experiment, as they called it so many years ago. A social experiment. And from this experiment, there were policies that were being followed. But the story of this school and hundreds of other schools across this country that were built in the 1800s, early 1900s, to house Native children, I was one of them. I was taken from my home, beautiful Leech Lake, taken from my parents and my grandparents, put on a bus, 300 miles later, getting off in Pipestone, Minnesota. I not only attended Pipestone Indian School, I was transferred after six years without seeing my mother, without seeing any of my parents, without hearing the Ojibwe language, without listening to any stories about the Ojibwe people, without going ricing, without making syrup, without making drums, None of that. I was finally allowed to go home for 30 days. And during this period of time of six years, that was at Pipestone, and many of the children that went to schools like this, we were also beaten. Beaten by speaking. When I went there, I could speak the Ojibwe language. But in the six years of punishment, there was corporal punishment. Beatings took place every day. And every night, even today, when we used to have the sun dances down at Pipestone, right down to the quarry, I could, as if I could hear the crying of the children every night. Crying. And I was one of them. It wasn't an experiment. And I'm going to tell you why that it was something else. I couldn't teach my daughter to speak the Ojibwe language because it was beaten. Not all of it, the, the, the spirit of Anishinaabe was not beaten out of me. I ran away from these schools. I ran away from them. And each time that they would find me, they would bring me back. And then there would be more, more beatings. I had to go through the hotline. Kids on both sides. I had to run down it. They would beat, beat us. And one of the advisors says, why do you do this? Why do you run away when you know you're going to get beaten? I said, I don't like this place. I hate this place. That's why I run away. And I kept running away from all the schools. They transferred me to another boarding school in North Dakota, farther away. And I ran away from that one. <clears throat> Three years later, they allowed me to go home for 30 more days. And I went to another boarding school in South Dakota. It's kind of difficult sometimes for me to 
speak about this because it didn't happen 70 years ago. Like this morning school closed 77 years ago. But for me, the beatings was just a moment ago. Just a moment ago. And this government, the U.S. government, had did something to thousands of other children. Interrupted a pattern which had been established by the Creator of how to live, how to be, how to do things. Even how to hunting, fishing, and trapping, harvesting wild rice, making drums, finding the names for the next generation and naming ceremonies, sitting around that drum to learn those songs. I could not pass any of that information on to my children. I couldn't do it. Because I didn't have, what could I pass on to them? How to iron my shirt? How to be at the wood shop? That's what they taught me how to do. All manual labor. I used to go out to the, how to plant corn. That's what they were trying to turn us into. You know, labor camps. What could I teach my children? There was no instructions in, the, in any of the, no learning about how to be a parent, how to be a father. None of that. They never said, someday maybe you might be able to be a senator or a congressman or a physician or a lawyer. No. They never said any of that. Because in their mind, we would never be that. We would never be a, a U.S. Senator. We would never be a physician. We would, we would always be a nurse or a nurse's aide. Nothing wrong with that. But if, they, if they're telling you that's all you're going to be, there's something wrong with that. To forcibly take children away from their homes, to deny them the right to speak their language, or if they do speak it, beat them until they beat it out of them. And you've seen the, the model, kill the Indian, kill the Indian, save the man. That fits the description of cultural genocide under the United Nations. That's what it is, that's what it was. It was not, you know, they, they were following policy. Policy. But not only the policy in this country of doing all that shameful, shameful work for the government and the, yes, and also in complicity with the churches. In complicity. What they were doing here in this country also, we call them boarding schools up north, residential schools. So the whole continent was put on notice by both governments to change them, kill the man, save the, kill the Indian, save the man. You cannot do that. You cannot kill what the essence of being an Anishinaabe is. You cannot kill that. 
might drive, you might drive the language out of me. You might drive the the songs out of me. But you can never kill the essence of who we were, who we are. That is the strength. But I could pass that on to my daughter, to my friends. I say my daughters. I have ten daughters, by the way. Ten daughters. Growing up in the boarding school, you learn to whip. But I never pass that down to my children. I never whip them. Never do. Oh, I, I, I always said, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> Why, those of you, I'm a grandparent now, but oh man, what, what a period of time that was. But you know, when, they, when they're not back at 8 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock, then they rage and become mad and angry. And you want to kill them? I'm going to kill them when they get home. Get home. If I ever find them. But then they stay away so long. Then you begin to worry. You worry. You start calling the police. Start calling the hospitals. And then when they show up, no matter how late, you're glad to see them. And I think that's they learn that. <laughs> but cultural genocide is what it was and ladies and gentlemen boys and girls that is a crime yes. Yes. it's not a policy it's not it wasn't a social experiment that was criminality it didn't border on criminality, it was criminality. And as I said, the parties to this had to be, and must be, and always will be, the culprits in those times, the U.S. government and the churches. I wanted to tell you that part of the story first because I'm going to tell you another part of the story which really tears me up. When I went home after the six years, I lost contact with my mother and my grandparents. And I was kids were getting letters. Every now and then, one letter, one letter a week. And my, my love for my mother was, we were drifting apart. And then finally it drifted up so far on my part that I just felt, you know, completely abandoned. Why didn't she write to me? Why didn't she send me any presents during the holidays? And then when I came home on that first, after six years, I asked my mother, why didn't you write to me? And she said, I did. I said, why didn't you come and try to see me or I tried to do that too, and, but she did, we didn't talk anymore about that. I just let it go. And then I went to this other boarding school, and again, no letters. And I came home again. I didn't question it because I didn't I didn't have the emotions anymore to say, why didn't you do this? Because I thought that's the way she was. Gave birth to me, set me off. 
I didn't understand the boarding, the buses that came to that reservation in northern Minnesota. That's where I lived. I didn't understand the nature of how we were being pushed onto that bus. So many years later, and they said it was a forced roundup, working with the with the Cass County welfare agencies. Get the addresses. And then my love for my mother was gone. It never never came back. Last two years ago, there was they were putting together a documentary about about Dennis Banks. And it entitled A Good Day to Die. And they they went to Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas rather, and they found this this circle center, the federal center where all of the records of this government is held. And they found my school records at Pipestone and at Lopton Landry as well. And Tosh, my daughter Tosh, who was on the on the crew team there doing the documentary about my life, she says, Dad, we, we've got we got your school grades. You want us to bring him home? I said, Yes. I want to see what I want to see how I remember the schools and the teachers and stuff like that. And the school became my parent. The school itself became my father, my mother, my grandfather. <laughs> it became who I looked up to. And all the friends that I met, some of them are, are still alive and become my friends for all my life. And I said, yes, bring, bring the information to me. And she did. And she handed me the school records, but she also had an envelope, a manila envelope, very thick. And in it were letters. There, there were letters from my mother. And I started to read them. Then I realized that I couldn't read these letters alone. So without saying anything, I, we drove to the cemetery and I went over to my mother's grave and I started reading these letters. And also, there was also one letter where she sent money to the U.S. government, to the United States government, asking, here's enough money for a bus ticket, my son. And I kept reading the letters and the tears started to, started to flow. I thought, wow. I couldn't, couldn't hardly even finish the letters. And I don't think that I could ever forgive this government for what it did to me and thousands upon thousands of other children. Never. And yet, because of my training in board, boarding schools, he learned to become a military soldier. 
And I entered the military <coughs> and spent eight years military saluting yes sir or no sir. I say that because even even when I felt that I was abandoned by my mother, that I would continue my relationship with, this, with the boarding school and go on into the military. Had I known about those letters, it might have been different. My life might have been, at least my relationship with my mother would have been, would have still existed. But in my mind, in my mind, in my heart, that, it did come back to me. And I just felt, you know, I offered apology to my mother. I don't know, I don't know how I can not get over this. When Pumpkin was up here earlier, she really I'd like to quote from her. No more fear, no more tears, no more hiding our hurt inside. Healing in prayer, acknowledging our clan, the names, our spirit, our spirit is one no one can change. And I started the military over, I started on a path which would lead me to this spot today. The American Indian Movement was formed because of the brutality of, of the government, the U.S. government. And I say that what this government did to myself and to thousands of other children, including the children, and, the, and all of the deaths that 143 deaths that were outlined in the 149 deaths. And I don't even know if they, were, if they all died. I don't know if they all died. I mean, they're dead, but I don't know if they died. Maybe they were killed. Maybe they were murdered. Because when you not mur murdered maybe by the hands of us, but murdered because of how a lot of us felt when the beatings took place. You run, I want to run away again. So, I'm over it now. I mean, I'm over the feeling now. Um, but I, w I wanted to come here uh, because the experience never dies with you. It never, you never forget it. Every day it's there, every, every morning that I wake up, I don't immediately think about Pipestone, but during the day I think about it. And there is an immersion school at our, at our reservation now where my, where my granddaughter goes to school. It's a total immersion about learning the Ojibwe language. And I have two, two uh, son and a grandson and a granddaughter in it, and they are, they are learning. And to me, it, it's it's like to to restore to, in my home, in my mind, to restore something that I, that I missed as as being a father. I, I didn't know how to be a father, but 
I know how to be a grandpa. I can. I know how to spoil the kids. Maybe that's what grandpas and grandmas are supposed to do. So, the fight, the fight to, at least in the United States, is not ended. Um, because they, they said, you know, they've offered apologies. But, you know, I want to sue, I want to sue this government. Because I, I, if I don't say anything in my life about it, when I'm gone to the spirit world, I say, well, what, what was all that about? <laughs> what was all, you know, they went, so he went to the, they took him to the school and all that. Well, he didn't do anything about it? Well, what was all that about? And so, you know, when I was, uh, I was charged by this government, by the way. You know why um, um, I was at Wounded, Wounded Knee, at a place called Wounded Knee. And there was an armed struggle, an armed fight between the United States government, who had on their side 300 U.S., 300 FBI agents, 90 United States Marshals, and also military equipment and personnel. Uh, there was armored, they call them armored personnel carriers. And they used that. They, they, they hid inside of them. They would shield themselves and they would fire upon, they would fire guns at us for 71 days. But the judge, and they charged me. They charged me with seven, 17 major crimes. I was facing 250 years in prison, plus a life sentence. It was absurd. I mean, I would, I would laugh about the consequence what they were trying to make me do. 250 years. I used to ask my co-defendant, Russell Mead, I said, what do you think we should do first? Should we do the 250 years? Or should we do the life sentence? And Russ Mead would, he would joke with me, say, hey, Banks, why don't you do the 250 years and I'll do the life sentence? Because actually, in, in, in sentencing guidelines, a life sentence is 17 years, 8 months, and 23 days. That's what a life sentence is under federal guidelines. So I said, well, I'll try and do it. I'll do that 250 years. So I'm on, on my 70th year right now. So, but I was there, and the judge dismissed, or well, my opening statements to them was that I'm on trial here, but I'm not the real culprit. The culprit is the U.S. government. So, I said, then we will prove that they were wrong. The trial lasted nine months, by the way. And there was a lot of mischievous, a lot of illegal acts that are being carried on by the FBI, the, what they call the case agents and the U.S. Attorney's Office. The judge caught it himself was on a discovery motion, gave us information how what they were going to use against us, but it was all blanked out. They, they put the, but on the ones they gave to the U.S. that they had, they had information on it. And the judge wanted to see that, wanted to know why was there such a glaring discrepancy going on in this courtroom. And finally, after all this, shenanigans, all of it, the judge, and, and he was very upset when he heard that the U.S. military was there at Wounded Knee. And when he, he decided then to, to dismiss the charges against us based on the, the, the uh, information, uh, the, the, um, the allegations that were made against us, couldn't be proven. 
And what he, what he was seeing was that the U.S. government was violating civil laws in this country. And he said, finally he said, on the last day, he says, I don't care if I have any friends left in the U.S. Attorney's Office, this is a federal judge speaking, in the FBI office, the U.S. Marshals, or anybody. I used to be, I was a commander, he points at the big flag behind him. He said, I was a commander during World War II, and I used to be proud of this flag. But today I'm ashamed of it. Because you, and he pointed to the prosecuting, the desk there, he said, you have polluted the waters of justice and dismissal. And dismissal is the only cure. He went on for 91 more minutes, <coughs> castigated the government. And he finally says, at the beginning of this trial, he said, Mr. Banks made a statement that it wasn't he that was on trial, that it would be the government. He says, not today. I see that he was right. He says, you guys are the ones that committed wrong. They, they dismissed the charges based on governmental misconduct. So they call it misconduct. Like they call the policies to whip the kids policies, but actually there are crimes. There's a book going around in Canada now about the national crime of residential schools and the beatings and the deaths. So we can heal, we can heal, but we cannot forget, and it's the emotional mind, mind that says, I'll never forget this. And I'll never allow this government, I'll never let it go one day. And I'm going to not only ask for forgiveness from them, but compensation. And I'm not, not say money, but I'm going to ask for compensation, give back the land, a lot of the lands that you stole from us. Give these lands back to us. There's only one American president that has given land back to Indian people. And there's posters of him in Taos Pueblo right now. Every time I go up there and visit those guys up there, it's the big picture of Richard Nixon. And he was the only sitting president that gave land back to Native people. And and he was run out of office. He said, Christ, wait a while, wait till he gives back a little bit more land. Then, you know, then so, but we liked him. We liked Tricky Dick. So, as long as he was giving land back, we were in line. So, I want to say, just I'm leaving the stage right now. I want to say that to Shannon and to Dee and to Charmaine and to Saginaw Band, I, I, I really feel at home here. And even looking at this boarding school, we visited it so many times with Paul Collins and Carol. Even with that, I feel feel at home, and that's where I feel actually in all with all of our land. But maybe the the parting shot would be: it wasn't pleasant at Mount Pleasant for this school, and for all those schools across the country that forbid us from talking and singing. So I'm going to sing a song, a song. I sang this song this morning, and somebody else sang the other version, the, the white version, 
a while ago, um, I'm going to see if you if you know of any a melody that it sounds like. See if any of you um, young people might know where it came from. <coughs> I know the I know the the reverends and all all the people that spoke a while ago. Uh, Reverend was it Devin? Were you the one that sang the song? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to sing a song. And so, Devin, I want to congratulate you for singing the song. Uh, in the Ojibwe language, and I, I encourage you to continue on. Sing as many as you can. And the song goes like this. Missionaries used to come to our reservation and they would sing these songs every Saturday and Sunday. And there was many churches on our reservations. And I knew I knew the the menu of every one of these churches because I would we'd go to their places in the evening. Because one night's pancake breakfast at some church, and the next night it's spaghetti dinner at the other church. <coughs> And the other one is fry bread, taco fry bread. So, I, but I knew all of them. So it was a matter of survival for me to go to these churches. And I don't care if they counted me. And count all you can. I'm going to eat. So, but I'm not, I will come to your church when you come to my sweat lodge. So, so, Thank you so much for, this story is not, this is not the end of this story. And I'm glad that there's so many young people here from, from Mount Pleasant here. Are, are you from Mount Pleasant? They're coming out here and observing and being part of our day out here. It's a very historic day. As Mike noted, it's a very historic. Guys, this is, this is part of the healing. I feel good that I came up here now, and you know, I I thought I was going to break down. Uh, I probably will later on, but, but I I felt I feel good about it, and I think maybe uh, just hearing what Mike and them are doing up north, and and what people here are doing, um, is is part of the healing process. So I will be in Washington D.C. on. July 7th, as our 5,500 mile walk will end there. So, I ask these young people in your lifetime, you know America, you should walk across it one time in your life. Just one time. I, I've, I've gone a northern route, I've gone the southern route. I prefer the southern route because it's a little warmer. Uh, but right now, going through Alligator, I said, why do they call this Alligator Alley? He says, come over here. So we went over to the bank, and here there was alligators close to where we were sleeping. I said, oh, yeah. I'm getting out of there. Thank you very much.
Wow. 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 Wow.